So Alexis, I did not want to watch this a second time, but I still had to take my notes. So I had to watch it a second time. I, I, I just didn't want to do it. I was in the mood. I, I hear you, Kay. Like I um, didn't watch it twice. And this morning, I, I spent a, one sitting on Saturday doing all my notes. And this morning, I woke up and I was like, oh, we're doing the third nerd episode. And then I was like, no. no we already recorded that episode. And I spent the entire day trying to figure out what this episode was. And I could not remember until I looked it up. And then I was like, oh, yeah, this episode. Yeah, this one. It's just sort of fine. Like, the other ones in season five have been, like, standouts. And I feel like we have a lot of standouts coming our way mm-hmm. after this episode. And this one, I don't get me wrong. Guest stars, like, chef's kiss. Fabulous guest, star, guest stars. But it does leave something to be desired. Like, I did not need a rewatch of this one. Yeah, it, um, it was okay. I agree with you, though. I absolutely love John Michael Higgins and I absolutely love Gene Smart. Oh my god. Um, and I think those are going to be fantastic. They, they, I mean, they made fantastic guest stars and they make fantastic stuff in general. But um, outside of that, it was just meh. Like, I didn't even remember who the murderer was until significantly far oh, through. Oh, I remembered that immediately, but... The second we see, what what's our guest star um um lead, lead femme fatale's name oh yeah Jean Smart? the second I saw her I went what's her up name uh Jillian Jillian yeah. thank you the second she turned around in the very first scene I was like designing women <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then I wanted to watch that <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just okay, but I do have a significant amount of notes, so I say we start the episode. It's showtime. This is... To the Blueberry! I am Alexis, and I am a real-life Gus. I'm Kaylee, and I'm a real-life Sean. Together, we make up a a real-life best friend duo who decided to start a podcast. So we had a good reason to talk to each other once a week. And uh, we decided to make it a rewatch podcast of Psych. Our favorite show. And the buddy Mm -hmm. comedy of the ages, if I may say so myself. I agree with that. I hear that. This week's episode is Season 5, Episode 4. Chivalry is not dead, but someone is. Did you have an ellipsis or a comma? I did. Okay. I had an ellipsis this time. Yeah. Okay. Um, we don't get a flashback in this episode. We start no. off at a fancy party. We don't find out until much, much later, it should be said, that this is a benefit of some sort. Because I just thought it was some random fancy party that this guy through so that all his wannabe sugar babies can meet rich older <laughs> women because that's kind of what it seems like like we enter the scene it's a big random fancy party there's a live really jazzy sort of a band um i wrote jazz music ball thing that's how i describe this yeah and then we see these two like young hip dudes like waiting at a bar like talking to each other like man don't we have it made Living in Santa Barbara, perfect night, two perfect women on our arms. How did we do it? Okay, it's very confusing, and I think they did it on purpose. Because there's a woman standing on either side of these fellas, and, like, one is even one of the guys is even looking at one of the girls when the other one says this, about, like, two perfect women on our arms. Um, it becomes apparent very quickly that one of these guys is a little bit, like, neurotic or something. Because he's like, how's my pocket square? Are these the right glasses for this type of drink? Like. <laughs> the other one's like, dude, calm down. And then they leave those two women at the bar. And we walk up to our our two guest stars, Lee Gar- Garlington and Jean Smart, whose names we find out later. But um, they are obviously 
older women than these young gentlemen. And they're just very happy to, to be there with them. Um, the blonde lady, whose name we will find out very soon is Jillian, says, what does a lady have to do to get a dry martini around here? There is an older woman who is kind of sitting um, away from them who starts coughing. And the young, somewhat neurotic boy maybe starts to cough to try to like cover it for her because he's being a gentleman. But then he actually starts choking. Yeah, at first there's sort of an awkward laugh of just sort of like, oh, I guess something's in the air. And then he starts like really coughing and having trouble maybe breathing. And then he kind of like, his eyes kind of roll up and he just like falls over this balcony. He, he plummets, he hits the floor at the bottom and it, it's apparent to everyone that this man is dead. And that's our first scene, guys. We just saw a man fall to his, well, maybe <laughs> fall to his death. <laughs> Well, they definitely did, because here comes Sean and Gus. Would somebody please tell me why you dragged Gus and I out of bed in the middle of the night to tend to an elder woman, woman, elderly woman who is simply resting her eyes? She's not dead. Are you dead? He literally touches her and she, like, twitches awake. Jules is like, excuse me, and then points to the body on the ground. Um, Lester's like, we don't need your theatrics. You can go away now. Go back to bed. Sean said... If someone is out there killing handsome young bachelors in Santa Barbara, then all of us are in danger. Well, maybe not all of us. Certainly Gus and myself. Um, Sean notices a couple of things here. Um, I called the one boy from earlier the fake fancy boy because he has a really annoying, affected way of talking. It sounds very, like, East Coast, Upper Crust, like, <laughs> <laughs> Connecticut lockjaw type of accent. It's irritating and um so i just call him um fake fancy boy but he notices <laughs> sean notices him comforting the older lady with the dark hair and then he sees a uh, a gentleman on a cell phone that he takes notice of and then lassiter is like this is clearly just a slip and fall like we don't even need you here please go away in that case, we should be looking for a banana peel or a roller, roller skate. Perhaps a wet bar of soap, though that seems the unlikeliest of the three. Lassiter says, McNabb, please escort these gentlemen off the premises. And Sean psychs out again. And this time he actually psychs out. Like he like envisions the fall and is like, dude, this guy in no way attempted to break his own fall. From 20 feet? Are you serious? Yeah, there was no signs that he tried to brace it with his ankles or his wrists, which to Sean means that he probably um, was dead before he fell. So in the next scene, we go to the Santa Barbara Police Department and Chief says, even though we're still waiting on toxicology to really come through, it does appear that he did not die from the fall and he was probably dead before he hit. Ugh, ugh. Chief Vic is actually very proud of Sean for getting it right. And Sean decides to gloat and says, in Lassie's defense, toxicology is not a science. Actually, it's the study of toxins. Get out of here. In, the, in that case, maybe you should feel a little bit foolish. <laughs> Lassie knows um, who it was. He's like, it was his date, Jillian Tucker, formerly mrs julian vanderholt jules is like oh yeah she she was in the news um a while back because her rich d husband died you almost said rich daddy didn't you no <laughs> <laughs> i almost said rich dead husband <laughs> and i was like oh, okay jumping the gun <laughs> um lassiter had always thought that that case was a murder and that it was Jillian, and that Jillian got away with it. And but now he it was ruled a suicide. Right. And now that he thinks that she's got the taste for it, and she's just killing off all the people. He says, come on, I know this is a home run. Chief, let me run with this. A disembodied voice from the corner is like, why don't we let them work together? Separate, but together. That lonely bald guy in the corner makes no sense. 
Gus said, am I the only person who's freaked out that he's been sitting there the whole time? So it's Henry. And Chief tells him, well, you're in charge of consultants, so it's kind of your call. Um, Henry <laughs> believes it will be a nice competition. Yeah, he's like, you're not afraid of a little competition, are you, Sean? Lasseter exits with, as a matter of fact, I've already won. And Jules just sort of like smugly follows behind him. Like, Jules, what in the history of this show has led you to believe that you guys <laughs> are going to beat Sean and Gus? <laughs> we get our opening credits. And then the next place we open is at this uh, dead gentleman's apartment with Lassiter and Juliet. Lassiter wants them to, you know, get into his medicine cabinet, collect all the stuff they need from here, and get out of here so they can question Jillian. The cradle robber. Jewel, I just wrote Jules versus the double standard. She's like, when when an older man is dating a younger woman, he's a hero. Which is a statement very of its time, because now Leonardo DiCaprio is, is a total punchline about this. Because he only dates 24-year-olds, <laughs> despite his advanced age and (laughs) um it should be said like whether it's now or then i think it is kind of looked at askance when an older woman when it's a may december relationship and it's an older woman and a younger man and she's Mm -hmm. like this is bogus like why and and lasser just instantly goes because it's gross (laughs) Sean and Gus are already there. Sean is actually hanging upside down in one of those, like, back stretcher things and scares the bejeebies out of Lassiter. He's like, I'm sorry I made you made that noise in front of the group. <laughs> to get into the mindset of the victim, I rented American Gigolo last night. So Jules is like, oh, you think this has something to do with sex work? Lance, we finally find out his name, did not have a, quote, job, and it was dating a woman two times his age. And that super trooper pinball machine in the bedroom didn't pay for itself. At this point, we can say that um, Jay... Oh, crap. I, I don't have his name up in front of me. Um, Shendikahar. Chendras. Yep. Yeah. He Who directed our Bollywood episode. Um, and and was, was in it. Was in Super Troopers. Yeah, and was in the Bollywood episode. He's the director of this episode, too. Sean psychs out on a book called Killing with Class, The Art of Seduction Through the through Charm and Sophistication. We also find out our victim's name was Lance Tolkien. Which Tolkien, thank you. Turns out Sean is stuck upside down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I took this as a reference to um, the Rob Schneider movie, when he tries to become a gigolo. When Sean does get up with Gus's help, he goes and picks up the book and says, the question is, who exactly is he killing? Because it's called Killing with Class. And the book is signed by the author Clive Prescott, a.k.a. John Michael Higgins. And the signature reads, to Lance, my most artful and gentlemanly student. Happy hunting. Cordially, Clive Prescott. Yes, I'm talking like this. Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo. There it is. Thank you. (laughs) Sean remembers that Clive was the gentleman that he saw on the phone at the party. And he's like, new lead. And also he can't feel his feet. I can't feel them, Gus. I need you to feel my legs. No, I need you to to be be my my legs. (laughs) So we go to Clive Prescott Enterprises, and he's giving a lecture, basically telling younger fellas how to pick up sophisticated and elegant elder women. Um, And What is this? Like Fight Club for Butlers? (laughs) I will say that um, there are a lot of shows who kind of take that pickup artist that's like really skeezy, and they like wear fedoras so they can peacock, and they kind of do the whole put women down, like, backhanded compliment. Mm -hmm. Like, they, that's a very real thing, and there are a lot of shows that reference that. I love that this is, like, how to use manners to woo, like, a woman of a higher, like, class sort of thing. But Mm -hmm. 
I feel like it feels so that you can be her sugar baby, right? And it it, it would feel less like <laughs> okay, not that it's not skeezy still. If it's like a how to be a sugar baby lecture, which it very much is, but if it was clear about that, and if they were just open with it, like I feel like everyone would be happy with that arrangement. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Just like being more honest about it instead of. Being gentlemanly, I'm going and, to but also ending it with you. happy hunting. Come on, bro. Yeah, because then it's it like, I don't know. It, I, I get that there's an argument that relationships can work transactionally. And even though a lot of people would like balk at that, like there's an argument to be made. However, if you're tricking a woman into being your sugar mama... And not knowing she's your sugar mama, that feels worse somehow. <laughs> like, she thinks it's love, but it's actually the transaction. <laughs> yeah. When Gus, uh, when Sean introduces himself, he also introduces my partner, Chaz Bono. Which is a real person. <laughs> it's it's Sonny Bono and Cher's son. Like, why, oh, why are okay. we... <laughs> Clive said, if you're going to create a fake occupation, at least create one that sounds real. Gus says, I'm also a pharmaceutical sal salesman. Pharmaceutical. I wrote that. Well, that sounds pathetic, and it's certainly not sexy. Sean says, isn't the gentleman thing a little bit mm, dated? With my method, there is no eligible woman that I could not seduce. How about you? Oh, <laughs> I do. I do all right. Like, he's, like, kind of brushing his shoulder <laughs> off. <laughs> no one believes him. And Clive asks, when was your last successful relationship? Define relationship. And then Clive gives the literal Webster's Dictionary definition of relationship. And then he says, Webster. I hardly think Emmanuel Lewis is an authority on relationships. And he's the man who played Webster in the television show Webster. <laughs> the scene, the scene kind of ends with, uh, with Clive asking, "May I ask you a personal question? Have you ever been tested for idiocy?" Okay, here's where Clive starts to give me the ick, because before this, I was just like, "Okay, this whole thing is just kind of like borderline," but. I will say that calling someone an idiot or a moron in a clinical sense has to do with IQ. And the whole idea of measuring someone's IQ is rooted in um, eugenics. That's what it's mm -hmm. called. And so, and so I started getting the ick from that. And then the next scene doesn't help his case any in my eyes. Clive ultimately dismisses everyone else from the class after Sean asks about Lance Tolkien. And... We head to the Santa Barbara Police Department. Yes. Um, Lassiter says he doesn't think Jillian's going to show that apparently they have an interview scheduled. He says she's already fled town. She's halfway to Ocapogo. Yeah. She killed her rich husband and then she got her boy toy and maybe he got too close to the truth. Or maybe she just likes the killing. It feels good somehow. Like the soft, supple flesh of a man buck. <laughs> that line gives you, is awful. <laughs> you disturb me, is Juliet's response. Then she says, and also, your theory disturbs me. And you disturb me. Also, Jillian is there. She apologizes. Oh, she just got up out of bed. I'm just beside myself. Okay, listen, her entrance, the way it looks kind of hazy, and she's like in the light of, this is, this is classic film noir femme fatale entrance like i just wrote enter jillian like a film noir femme fatale so i also picked that up but i took a totally different approach with it i i wrote she's fabulous and only has soft backlighting on her and i was wondering if that was a because she happens to be an older woman who is in this show who's supposed to be like fabulous all the time if they made a conscious effort to only put soft backlight on her so that she did continue to look like that and we couldn't see any of her other age marks like we end up seeing with Eugenia I I don't think these women are as old as this show is portraying them to be like the actresses are not 
like they're older women, but they are not like decrepit looking if you oh, give them no, a normal no, no, camera. Not by any means. Lassiter says, Do you recognize me? I was a lead detective on your husband's case because it was ruled a suicide. And she said, No, no. I believe that was a much younger man, less salt and pepper. And Juliet goes, I'm sorry, you just got out of bed? <laughs> because she is, she absolutely looks fabulous. Oh yeah, she's wrapped in this like, I don't know, satin dress and she's got like a wrap on her arm and she's just like, got this oh, coiffure yeah. of a hairdo. Ugh. Lassiter feels that she did not mourn her husband long enough and he props his leg up on the table and um, he, she tells him that she is late for a business meeting and I don't ride horses, detective. Oh, he said you didn't wait that long before getting back up on the horse. There it is. Um, so the shot of him, of her through his leg, because he has his leg propped up on the chair, is a direct callback to The Graduate. Because the, the line is also, Mrs. Tucker, are, or Miss Tucker, are you trying to seduce me? She just takes a beat and goes, not even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> she she admits that they were not in a happy marriage, a, a happy marriage, but she's mourning her loss her own way. And she says, what do you expect a woman of my age to do, detective? Knit? She just has like, sh- oh, I love her so much. Juliet calls Lassiter aside and is like, listen, Lassie. She is not going to a business meeting. She is going on a date. Look at her. She's real done up. Who's that for? Us? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe. If she's lying about this, she could be lying about other things. And Lassie wants to tail her. He says, yeah, you're right. We should tail her. And Jules is like, not what I said. And he literally goes, stop disagreeing with me when I'm agreeing with you. (laughs) He's such a putz this episode. (laughs) In Clive's office, Gus is asking about Lance. He says, can you tell us about Lance? And then there's this really stupid back and forth about can. You mean, am I capable of blah, blah, blah versus will? To which I say, Sean's saying, I've heard it both ways. And Clive saying, maybe on a farm is so elitist. And it as, is, yeah. like, as a, um, master of the english language (laughs) on like an education level (laughs) i can say that um if it's that colloquially widespread and commonly said both ways are appropriate and correct and clive Mm -hmm. can shove it up his snobby butt (laughs) i if you look at it from that perspective i 100 percent agree with you if you look at it from this is a one-hour comedy on usa network it's very funny Like, I laughed about it. It's funny, but it's still illustrating that the guy we're dealing with here is a total snob. And we can be fully in Sean's camp on this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Clive says that Lance did not master the art of manners, which we'll figure out more about later. Um, Sean puts his hand to his head and goes, actually, I'm sensing that it was quite the opposite. Didn't you once refer to him as your most artful student? I need to point out that Lance has been writing a note this whole time. And you mean Clive? Literally, thank you. Clive has been writing a note this whole time, and he's literally wax sealing it at this point. But then he said, one point for you, psychic. He was a good student. Did he show potential? Sure. More than most, perhaps. He was good, but maybe not as good as he thought. And then he stamps violently. Gus thinks that he's angry, and um, Clive quotes his own book at them. Snob. About how anger isn't worth it. And <laughs> he says, anger them, is no. easy. A gentleman takes his ire and turns it into insight. <laughs> he hands them a note and says, good day. He leaves, they open the note, and it is literally a thank you note for them taking an interest in the death of his student. Dear gentlemen, thank you for your inquiry about the death of my former student, Lance Token. 
Good luck with your investigation. Cordially, Clive Prescott. Gus is like almost impressed and Sean is like, man, his whole gentleman gentleman thing is a sham and I'm going to prove it. Lassiter and Juliet are on a stakeout following Jillian. And Gus and Sean jump into the back of their car. And Sean is wearing a fake beard. A fake beard that we need to remember, everyone. Oh, yeah. And Sean, or Lassiter tells them, that's a good way to get yourself shot. And what in the heck are you wearing, Spencer? I ain't Spencer. I'm Soup Can Sam. And when we do a stakeout, we blend in with the common folk. Gus said, I'm a regular guy in a car. I'm fine. Lassiter's like, right. Okay. So, I guess you just realized who the right suspect is, then. But they aren't tailing Jillian. Lassiter says, I bet Jillian's here to meet her new boy toy, maybe even younger than the last one. Younger? Who do you think she's meeting with? Justin Bieber? Such a weird pop culture reference. (laughs) Sean says, "Mm, don't you think it's maybe possible that she's the victim here, Lassie? Only for us to see Clive. And Sean and Gus said, that's our guy. We know who the murderer is. And we have the home run suspect. He's Santa Barbara's biggest dirty rotten scoundrel. Fist bump. So the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrels are about two con artists trying to con lonely rich women out of their money. Oh. It was actually remade. A couple of times. <laughs> Lassiter and Juliet are getting a second statement from the bartender who had been at the jazz ball party benefit thing. They say and they need to revisit his statement because they found out that the victim was poisoned. And Jules wants to know what the bartender can remember about his drink. He actually remembers it because it was different, classy, and cool. <laughs> Lassiter says, sea breeze, gotcha. Bartender said, no, a Garberdine Hightail. It was his favorite. Miss Tucker actually bought, brought a specific bottle of scotch to have on hand so that he could have this drink. The drink is Rora Scotch, Drambuie, and a teaspoon of honey. In my house, we drink something called The Godfather, and it's Amaretto and Scotch. That sounds delightful. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> Julia and Lassiter are like, get me that bottle. They're in the blueberry. They're now following Clive. That would be them, Sean and Gus. And Sean is on the phone with Henry. Henry's got some details for them about Mr. Prescott. Prescott's Prescott's last known liaison was with Lorian Bell, one of the wealthiest widows in Santa Barbara. She happened to die on a vacation in a, quote, drowning accident. Yeah, she went to South America with Prescott, and he was there at the time of her death. Sean is like, well, thanks for the lead, but he's slowing down, so I've got to go. I want you to be careful. So they hang up, and Sean's like, I think my dad is starting to like me. He sees Jillian and Clive and said, look at that, Gus. He's literally taking her to the bank because they're walking into a bank together. What's the next stop? The cleaners? They do like a a big eyes point at each other. (laughs) In an attempt to uh, fit in, I guess, Sean walks in with a jar of pennies. And they are ready to make a deposit. Yeah, he just, he plants it down. He gets Clive's um, attention And he just starts harassing the guy and he starts flirting with Jillian and and both of his his tactics work. He says, I'm here to visit my money. It's in a back room with a trampoline. I'm going to roll around in it for a little while. Maybe make it rain like an indecent proposal, except with no sex. Well, maybe sex. Miss Tucker, I'm Sean Spencer. (laughs) I'm sensing that you enjoy the company of younger men. Pointed look And for obvious reasons, I can't take my eyes off of you. And he really doesn't. And Jillian giggles. Oh yeah, she's charmed. But they have an appointment. Gus is like, 
what the heck was that? And Sean is like, what? The manager's manager's hair? hair? (laughs) Gus is like, no. Sean is like, that guy is a predator. Like, we have got to get her out of his clutches. And in the background, we can see Jillian checking out Sean. It's very cute. Sean, is this about your ego and trying to prove that you have more game than this guy? Psh. Well, actually, that would be a bonus. You're on your own. Oh, yeah. So Sean psychs out on her ring, and then um, he walks up to her, and he's like, Jillian, may I interest you in going to dinner tonight? I think we should just go out and paint the town. And he puts his hand to his head. Purple, since we were both born in February. Which comes back to my idea that Sean is probably an Aquarius. Here we go. Except for he could completely be lying to her. Yeah, but Aquarius, they're hard to read. They're like real unpredictable, kind of obtuse on purpose. (laughs) Okay. Jillian is absolutely shocked and that Clive cuts in to talk to Sean and tells him to back off. Oh yeah, it's clear he feels threatened by Sean here. You just pushed my competitive button and now it's on. He goes, if you... (laughs) Maybe I would be intimidated if you were actually wearing any buttons. <laughs> Clive just starts bad mouthing Sean and tells Jillian that he lacks culture, sophistication, culture and sophistication, and he smells of buffalo wings. Actually, what you're picking up on is buffalo flavored Snyder's pretzels of Hanover. Gus says <laughs> they're America's pretzels. Jillian is absolutely. Jillian is absolutely delighted by him. And Sean said, Jillian, have you ever dated a man who was triple jointed? No, I don't believe I have. She is completely falling for it. She's up for the date. They're going on the date tonight. But Jillian really has to leave to get ready. Also, one little point of concern. Her friend Eugenia has recently been disappointed by a man and... She'll really need Sean to come up with someone to escort her friend to dinner. Sean says, I have the perfect gentleman. Staring at Gus. <laughs> so it's date night. Uh, they're walking into this restaurant. Gus is super not happy. But right here, can I just say that if you look past the boys to where Eugenia and Jillian are sitting, Eugenia's arm is behind Jillian's chair, like resting on the back of it. Oh, good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just something I noticed. We get a Gus don't be George Hamilton's reaction to when Ashley came to him and said, Dad, I think I'll be an actor too. I have no idea who those people are. I don't know who Ashley Hamilton is. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, this is about solving the murder, not about dating these women. And then... Walks up to them and says, hello, ladies, your tramps have arrived. Ladies and tramps. Tee-hee. Um, we get a hello. Yeah, we get a Gus hello. And then Jillian's like, <clears throat> well, first things first, I always like to give a little get to know you gift. And Sean is like, oh, this is so awkward. I no longer have my ears pierced. I used to have three, but that was only because of Tears for Fears. Gus is like, Sean, those are cufflinks. They're very fancy diamond cufflinks. Pin in that. Sean Sean completely plays it off as a joke. And then Jeannie is like, oh, um, would you like a piece of gum? I only have one left. We can split it. She tears her gum in half and hands half to Gus. And he's just sort of taken aback by her. Um, we learn from Jillian that um, Eugenia has been staying with her since her husband died. And she doesn't really like going out much. She's had no luck with the other men that Jillian has set her up with. Maybe Gus will be the one. Isn't he so handsome? And Eugenia makes this noise like, oh, and like shakes her head. (laughs) It's very obvious that she does not seem interested in Gus. And then we hear Jillian go, don't look, don't look. Gabe Ben Kenley's over there with that tramp Olivia Ainsley. Sean's like, oh, no, that's too bad. And he, he like, notices that there's nothing going on between Gus and Eugenia. So he drops his napkin and he and Gus both bend over to get it. And he's like, dude, 
You have got to start pulling your weight here. I'm trying. Every time I smile at her, she puckers at me. <laughs> I'm not used to the pucker, Sean. He's like, she likes gardening. Ask her about flowers. The uh, kind of camera pans back and Jillian is coaching Eugenia on how to smile. <laughs> so Gus goes, um, so Eugenia, how old are you? That's when the guy brings over a bottle of wine and he's like, may I? Uh, and then Sean says, may I or can you? May you or can you? And the response is, I think he's from it right first name. Wow. I think I think he had it right the first time. <laughs> so um, the wine was complimentary from the gentleman across the way. And it's Clive sitting at a table alone like a creeper. Sean wants to take him out, sweep the leg. And he gets mad because Gus never wants to sweep the leg. Clive comes over and Sean's like, um, but there's no room at the table for you. Sean, don't be silly. There's a seat right here. And then Clive gets annoying talking about the wine. And he's like, I don't know how refined your palate is, but I think you'll find this one's particularly nutty and a little shy. I can't with this guy. That was Gus on the first day of kindergarten. Um, Gus doesn't like this story. <laughs> Eugenia excuses herself and Jillian goes too. And um, Sean, nope, Gus and Ch Clive immediately stand up and Sean's like, oh, wait, what? What are we doing? And then he and Clive sort of start to have a face off. Um, and then that annoying Gabe guy comes over. I don't have much. I see that. you're with, uh, Clive said, I see you're with Miss Ansley tonight. But you've dated everyone in the room, haven't you? I'm <laughs> just I learned from I learned from the best. But perhaps I'm not as good as Mr. Spencer. I see you're here with Miss Jillian Tucker today. But I always thought she was off limits. The professor said so. That would be Clive. Bum, bum. Jillian and Eugenia come back. Um Sean again forgets to stand. And Clive is talking about how he is taking Jillian to Peru soon. Because he's looking into acquiring art for her, and there's someone that he wants her to see down there. And Sean's like, you know what? It's kind of stuffy in this place. Why don't you and I, or why don't the four of us go somewhere a little less Prescotty? They are back at the psych office with pizza. And Sean is teaching her how to fold and eat the pizza. It's very cute. Um, Eugenia is just sort of scowling at Gus, though. Gus's response, no one over the age of 32 shuts this down. Um, Sean says to Jillian, I need to ask you a teeny tiny favor. Um, maybe for like a couple of days, you could just stay completely away and stop talking to Clive and also maybe not go to Peru with him. She thinks that he's jealous and she finds it very cute. And she like pets him. There's a lot of like <laughs> flirting and touching. And Gus is like, if you want to touch my head or do you want to touch my head? Women of all ages and races say it has magical powers. <laughs> Jeannie is just like, um, that's okay. In come Juliet and Lassiter, and uh, Jillian leaves Eugenia with Gus, and uh, Gus thinks that he needs to surprise her. He's like, yeah, I know your type. You don't like to project. You like your man to surprise you. I can do that. In come okay. ja uh, Jassy. So after uh, uh, Gus tells Eugenia, um, you like your man to surprise you, I can do that. And then Sean goes up to Lassiter and Jules and is like, why are you in my personal space? We just want you to know that you're dating our prime suspect. This is not a date. This is an investigation. We get it. Not everyone has as many choices out there. Don't be ashamed. Juliet's just rubbing it in his face that he's dating an older woman. You guys seriously think that we are interested in this woman? These women? We are trying to collect facts and find out what happened in this case. And then they all look over and they see Gus attempting to kiss Eugenia and she literally pulls back from him. Juliet and Lassiter say that Jillian had access to the bottle of scotch that may have poisoned Lance. And uh, 
Gus comes up and said, was he drinking a Gabardine hot, Gabardine Hightail? Because Prescott, Prescott created that drink. Yeah. And he was Lance's teacher. He taught him everything he knew. John points out that Clive is the one who could have spiked it because he knew that's what he was going to be drinking. Now, if you don't mind, Gus is a little busy trying to get some sweet, sweet noogie off of his old auntie. For the case. For the case. Everybody makes a face. And then it's a little bit later at the psych office. The boys are alone, doing a little bit of cleanup, chit-chatting. And Sean says, I could imagine a world where I got kind of frisky with Miss Tucker. I mean, I'm not saying I need to round the bases, but I could safely slide into second. Gus is really mad because he got the double pullback. I can't believe she rejected me. She rejected him. She smelled like mothballs. What's with that? (laughs) Sean said, sometimes you smell like styrofoam. I dig it. Sean's like, listen, we kept Prescott away from her. That's all we needed to do. I think it's just kind of like, oh man, I do not feel right. Maybe we got some bad pineapple on that pizza. Gus is like, no, I'm feeling fine. Oh, maybe it wasn't the pineapple. There's something wrong. Gus, if I die, it was Prescott. Prescott killed me. And then he collapses. There is a whole thing where he goes, um, Gus, I see a light. Maybe I should go towards it. Take care of my great Dane Lothar. What is that from? I didn't know what that was from. I don't know what it's from, but I had a moment where I was like, is, did, did they do a callback to this in Million Little Things? Because Gary, the character that, um, Rude plays, Rude plays, has a dog and I was like and it's a big dog and I was like oh my gosh did they end up getting him a great name and naming it Lothar just to see if anyone got the joke no that none of that happened uh it's a a mastiff and it's his name is um I don't remember his name that'll come to me at some point but I don't know it's gotta be something okay get a great Dane name him Lothar He's been poisoned. Remember, it was Prescott. He passes out. We're at the hospital. Sean's not dead. The doctor comes in with the clipboard and he says, well, it's official. You have been poisoned. Gus stands up. All the guilt. Sean, I slept with Stacy Whitaker when we were at the cabin summer of junior year. I know you had a crush on her and I'm really sorry. The doctor says, it's also official that you're going to be fine. And when I say sleep, I mean sleep. I literally mean sleep. I was so tired that night. I mean poop. I was sawing logs. (laughs) Sean's face. And then the doctor says that he was barely poisoned. Yeah, there were only traces in his system. So Sean's like, I'm not going to die. And he's like, well, I mean, maybe from all the tapioca and raisins in your stomach, but not from poison. In comes... Henry. Papa. Daddy. Hold me. Come. Come closer. Come and hug me. Henry's like, listen, Laster is interviewing both of your suspects. You have to get to the precinct. I vouched for you, Sean. Don't make me look foolish. Dad, I was poisoned. I heard barely. Come on, get your pants on and let's go. (laughs) So we're at... And then he... He rips... Out Sean's eyes. That's true. And Sean, and Sean howls. Screams like a little yeah, girl. Yeah, he howls. Yeah. So we go to the SBPD, and Jules and Sean are sitting across the interrogation table from Clive, and she wants to know where he was last night after he left the restaurant. Detective, have you ever read Lady Chatterley's, Chatterley's Lady Chatterley's Lover? Uh in college? With your corn silk hair. You might have stepped right out of its pages. Do you also feel trapped emotionally? The desire to be held, to be loved? Sean is literally getting a taste of his own medicine by having to sit there and watch someone else hit on Juliet, which is very funny. And he says, Um, wait, is this flowery crap actually working on you? If you read the book, you would know. 
This man has actual insight into the female psyche. I saw all the Emmanuel movies, including the one where she changed races. Changes races. Now, will you admit that your book is dated and that I have more game than you? I will not. Will you admit that you tried to murder me last night by poisoning my person? I will not. And also, I heard you were barely poisoned. Why do people keep qualifying that? (laughs) So Lassiter appears and he apologizes to Clive and they're letting him go. And Sean is beside himself. He's like, are you freaking kidding me? And Lassiter says, we had to let Evelyn, er, no, I said Evelyn. We had to let Jillian go too. We don't have enough to hold either of them. As he is leaving... Sean calls Henry in to, I don't know, bring it, bring down the hammer on Clive. And he immediately walks in and starts like hiding kind of behind his little clipboard and his papers. And Clive said, I know you, don't I? A gentleman never forgets the name. Henry, Henry William Spencer. He is the only student I've ever had to kick out. You didn't kick me out. You invited me to leave. Read between the lines. Sean can't stop saying, oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. And then Henry's like, please, please stop. And he's like, one more. In the style of Chandler Bing. Oh my god! Henry sees that Prescott was dating, or Henry says that Prescott was dating Harriet Feinstadt at the time of her death as well. And then a month later, her company went kaput. Henry's like, I need to run this down and do the due diligence on it and, like, follow up with this, but you need to start thinking like a detective. Like, take this, keep it in mind, but sit on it. Like, we've got to hold off. Got it. (laughs) So then we're back in Clive's class, and he's talking about how you need to attack and conquer. You can't just wait around for love. You have to go out and find it. You have to take it. You have to slay it if you must. Drag it back, but have it for yourself or something stupid. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting if I do say so myself. Sean has a question. Why is it that you'll stop at nothing to steal women's money and ultimately murder them? Those are ridiculous accusations. And Sean is like, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about Harriet Feinstadt and how she died in your presence? She had cancer. He was with her for the months leading up to her death. And then all of her sons took her money and ran her business into the ground. Okay, fine. But what about Lorraine Bell and how she died in South America on a trip with you? She was, um, she died by a stingray sting. And so unless you're accusing me of hiring a sea creature as a hitman. And then Gus says, okay, well, what do you do when an older woman spurns your advances? Clive's face. (laughs) Sean is like, okay, then what about why Jillian was off limits then? Because I love her. Oh, yeah. I'm a cad. I am a deceiver. I am am hopelessly and ridiculously in love. Oh, yeah. Sean really went after him until he admitted it. And this guy just like fully breaks down. He leaves. They follow him. Sean hands him a note. Dear Prescott. I am deeply sorry that I accused you of trying to kill me. Good day. I said good day, sir. Signed, Sean Spencer. Gus is like... Signed, Sean Spencer. You You misspelled your own name. I didn't use spell check. So Gus is like, well, what's next for you then? Like, what what do you do now? He doesn't really know what to do because a woman of the substance like Jillian does not fall for his tricks. He's going to propose and he's terrified. Um, he says that he figures he's going to take Eugenia out to tea so that he can, like, ask her best friend's advice before he pops the question. And Gus is like, well, hopefully she's less stingy with her advice than she is with her gum. Oh, well, that makes sense. Clive discloses to them that Eugenia is penniless and that Jillian takes care of her. Um, Sean's brain jumps to several conclusions here, and we see some flashbacks of when Gabe was comforting Eugenia because he was her date at the benefit, and then Gabe was there at the restaurant while, you know, they were all there, and maybe he spiked the 
wine that Sean was drinking. And so he's like, he's a gold digging murderer and just like jumps three steps ahead and decides that Gabe is the one that they need to find. So they call Lassie and Jules. They go to the gym and Lassiter and Juliet are looking for Gabe with like their guns drawn. Until they find him dead in the sauna with a drink on his lap. Okay. Now, Kaylee, what drink was that? (laughs) He had a bottle of vitamin water in the sauna with him. This is such an early 2000s moment because it took me straight back to college. I was like, what is that flavor? Is that like the dragon fruit flavor? Is that, is that triple X? Like what, which bottle is that? Sean is snooping through his locker, but believes that he was also poisoned. And um, Sean sees cufflinks that match his. Uh, Sean sees cufflinks that match the ones that Jillian gave him. And then he remembers that Lance also had those cufflinks. And we already knew that Lance was um, Jillian's date that night. So he's like, oh my gosh, L- Gabe was having an affair with Jillian. And so. Jules gets off the phone and says, well, the lab confirms the poison. Um, the main component to the toxin was naphthalin. Naphthalin? Naphthalin. We get a lot of this, and I don't know what it's referencing. Doctor? Doctor. Is that? Doctor? Doctor. I don't know if that's what it is, but that's what I'm I was about. like, what? And then Gus is like, oh my gosh, that all makes sense. Mothballs. But it wasn't from her. Eugenia smells of mothballs from her gardening. Yeah, she uses the mothballs as a pesticide, but they're toxic if ingested. Sean can see it. The perfect old person murder weapon. (laughs) I do want to say that when they were, like, running through the gym before they found the body, Laster literally vaulted over a guy who was bench pressing. Like, (laughs) there was a lot going on in that scene. Moving on. Juliet's like, we need to find Eugenia, but Sean remembers that she is having tea with Prescott, and he thinks Prescott's going to be the next victim because he's about to ask Eugenia about proposing to Jillian. Oh my gosh. So we're racing to the scene, the boys are in the backseat of Lassie's car, and then we're blocked by a car crash. It doesn't look like anyone was hurt, but everyone's blocking the road. The boys jump out of the car and run up the hill, and Lassiter then attempts to drive up the hill, but gets stuck. As the boys are running, Sean, or Gus said, Should I, shouldn't a case with an older woman killing people be less athletic? <laughs> so the boys run in all covered in forest, and the guy at the front, the concierge or the maitre d', is like, um, you're not dressed appropriately, and you don't have a reservation, and you can't come in here. <laughs> <laughs> in come Lassiter and Juliet. They do not care. They start running. The boys start following, and then finally Sean screams, Prescott, don't, don't drink that tea! Yeah, because he was literally raising the cup to his mouth. They confront Eugenia. They call her a murderess and a lesbian. Sean does the full synopsis. Eugenia was in love with Jillian, and she had to, the most to lose should Jillian get into a relationship. Eugenia actually killed the husband so that she could have Jillian all to herself. Um, Eugenia fully admits it. She's like, I was trying to protect her. She always chose the wrong man. I just didn't want to hurt or I didn't want her to get hurt. I'm the only one who really cared about her. And she gets all like kind of blubbery and Sean goes, Gus never even stood a chance. (laughs) Now I understand the double pullback. Lassiter arrests her. Eugenia is hopelessly in love um, and obviously has murdered a few people. She says, I always thought that Jillian and I would spend our final days together. It's so creepy. It's so creepy. And I think at this moment, we can take the opportunity to say, I don't remember if it gets better. But so far, this show does not have a great track record with the representation of LGBTQ community members. Um, The only other person I think we've seen who was maybe on that spectrum was the person suffering from dissociative identity disorder. And one of those personalities was in search of gender reassignment surgery. And the other personality within that body was the murderer of 
the episode. Yeah, so so now we have two characters, the only two characters that Kay and I can remember who happen to be a member of that community, and they both happen to be bad guys. But, like, it, also, it should be said that, like, people suffering from mental health, like the person with multiple, well, dissociative identity disorder, and, you know, some other people who, like, maybe have suicidal ideations or, like, look down upon people with suicidal ideations. Like, there's, like, a lot of weird things that were very of their time for this show. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out, statistically speaking, people of, of minority groups, people who suffer mental health, um, uh, you know, crises, and people who are members of minority groups like the LGBTQ community, they're much more likely to be suffering violence done to them than perpetrating violence. Like, why they gotta be the villain in this show? <laughs> I can't, I can't come up with a example where a member of that community is not the bad guy. So I'm excited to continue to watch the series to see. Um, but this was like a light that I noticed this episode. And I was like, huh, I've never noticed that before. So definitely of, of its time, like you said, but um, didn't age well. I will say I do think that most of our bad guys are are just regular bad people. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's not a good look. The optics aren't great so far. <laughs> yeah. We head back to Clive's school where he will not be teaching because he is going on his honeymoon. However, he has lined up a bunch of guest speakers, including psychic detective and true gentleman, Sean Spencer. Sean gets up to make a speech and he says, My friend Gus says that we could all stand to be a little more gentlemanly. But I think he is dead wrong. Wow. He's like, I think there are other ways of doing things than the right way that I see of doing things. And Clive keeps punching in here to be like, it's not a real way. Sean is like, but it's my way. And Clive's like, it's barely a way. And he's like, <laughs> it goes on for quite some time. Um, Sean says, basically, I want my father on his deathbed, four or five years from now, to look at me and say, that. That is the man that I raised. And I want him to be pointing at some other guy. Because that would mean that I'm not biologically his son. In the prison, we see Eugenia come up to the window to talk to somebody and he's talking she's talking to Gus and he goes hello thank you for taking the time to see me this is such a cringe scene <laughs> so basically Gus is just there we can skip all of it if you want to I'm okay I with just... that until we get to but you dated that other guy at the beginning at the benefit and she said yes but I killed him but she wasn't even dating him Oh, no. No, no, no. She did end up she killing She did Gabe. end up killing Gabe. Yeah. She goes, okay, would you feel better if I had attempted to murder you? He makes this sort of like... She tells him that he needs to find a nice girl and focus on her and never, ever come back here again. Yeah. It, it's so weird. Gus was there for his own ego just to confirm that the reason he had zero chance of seducing this w triple homicide uh, charged woman was because she was in fact in love with another woman. Get over yourself, Gus. I love Gus, but get over yeah, yourself. Yeah, it's man. such a, like usually something that immature is Sean's thing. <laughs> Gus said, um, because you dated that other guy at the beginning, at the benefit. And I got a kick out of the fact that he said at the beginning, because he was obviously referring to the beginning of the episode. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. And I just, I found that hilarious. And I was, I wrote a big note that said, beginning of the episode, bah, ha, 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 ha. And it took me a little while to figure out what that meant. But now that I remember it, mm -mm. that's what I meant. Oh boy. Well, we got through this one. We can move on now. <laughs> yeah. I, I just finished editing episodes four episode three i don't know the last one that i i edited and i remember saying you know tens across the board so far this one 
This one wasn't a 10 across the board. Now, the best scene was definitely Jillian's entrance at the SBPD and her back and forth with Lassiter. Like, that, Mm -hmm. that to me was funny. That was, that was top tier. I don't know. This episode as a whole, it's like, it's fine. Let's just move on. (laughs) Yeah. I agree. On that note, I am Alexis. Doesn't anyone use first names anymore? And I'm Kaylee. Who do you want? The creepy old ladies or the Ken dolls? The Ken dolls. Mm. <laughs> and this has been <laughs> To the Blueberry. Psych out. <laughs> <laughs>